In my hallway, I'd like to bring you very briefly up to date with the Kimball Way clan, our elder daughter Susan and her husband Mark and their two children, Ethan, age 11, and Sadie, age 6, are doing very well living in uh, East uh, Burlington. It seems that uh, life falls uh, the children around pretty much, especially Ethan, who uh, plays one or two sports every season. And uh, uh, and we enjoy getting out and, uh, and being with them. Our kind of exciting news came on January the 10th when Sarah and her husband Graham became parents for the first time. Our third grandchildren is a boy whom they named, you'll never guess, <laughs> William. <laughs> Fifth generation. Could have blown me over. They're calling him Will. Uh, and, of course, Linda has a picture or two on her camera, just happens to have that with <laughs> You may have heard of the story of a little girl who was sitting at a kitchen table with a few sheets of paper and a box of crayons. She was drawing a picture. What are you drawing, her mother asked. I'm drawing a picture of God, she responded. But darling, said her mother, Nobody knows what God is like. Without hesitation, the little girl replied, but they will when I have finished the picture. <laughs> <laughs> On this first Sunday after the day of Pentecost, we gather to celebrate the complex mystery of God, which the church calls Holy Trinity. The challenge of Trinity Sunday is a significant one, as we seek to reaffirm the basic tenets of our Christian faith and delve into the ways we experience God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer of our lives. Not only, not only is this difficult to do, it is a very real challenge to make it relevant and meaningful in the form of a homily. Clergy are known to avoid preaching on Trinity Sunday, if at all possible. <laughs> a standing joke at St. Peter's Airedale, where Linda and I serve, is that on Trinity Sunday, the rector always schedules one of the five associate priests to preach. This year, there was to be a guest preacher, a speaker from one of our diocesan <coughs> faith works ministries. Well, yesterday we had a cleanup uh, a day at the church, and I uh, bumped into Canon Reed and started to rip her about not preaching today, wherein she said the faith work speaker had phoned on Friday and canceled out. <laughs> so she indeed would be preaching at all three Eucharists this morning. The concept of the Trinity is not named in the Bible although there are many references to it. It is a metaphor developed by the early church to help people explain the three ways in which they experience God. Times have changed and so have we. We are not today what we were yesterday or what we will be tomorrow. Our faith is based on our relationship with God. Although God does not change, God's being is expressed through our ever-changing lives. We in Toronto and in the greater Toronto area come from a wide variety of backgrounds with a wonderful diversity of cultural heritages. We are, as the early Christians were, people of the way, and we can only put words around in reality we perceive at this particular point in our spiritual journey. And because of the inadequacies of language, we don't do that particularly well. The point I'm getting at is that it is all too easy to limit God to a formula, to make God so small that God, uh, that God conforms to our individual perceptions. The story of the little girl drawing a picture of God is rather cute. But the speaker at one of our diocesan clergy conferences a few years ago lamented at how his fellow American Christians tend to interpret scripture as individuals instead of as a church. 
He encouraged us to read scripture as a community of faith and allow the Spirit to lead us through God's Word so we might move forward together, inspired by God and led by God's grace. The doctrine of the Trinity emerges from the ordinary stuff of human history and human experience, made extraordinary by Jesus Christ. It is not a theory made for the benefit of academics, but it is a recipe for living. The formula for Christian life is seeking to do God's will with the companionship of Jesus Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. For many of us who have spent our life in the church, the usual order of this triune blessing reflects the growth in our spiritual lives. <coughs> we came first as children to meet and love Jesus. Then through his life and teaching, we came more fully understanding of God, our Creator, before experiencing the power and presence of the Holy Spirit <coughs> within our lives. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the 16th century Spanish founder of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, gave us insight into the unity and diversity of the Trinity. Once while at prayer, he envisaged the Trinity to be like three musical notes that make up a single chord or sound. Perhaps the best known insight came from St. Patrick, who used the three leaves of one clover to convey the idea of the Trinity. The shamrock has three distinct leaves and yet is one plant. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one supreme being. Three generations of one family all lived in the same house. Grandpa, Dad and four-year-old grandson were all named John. One day the phone rang. Hello, said one of the women in the household. May I speak to John, the caller asked. Which John would you like, the woman responded. John the Father, John the Son, or John the Holy Terror? <laughs> In today's Gospel reading, we see Jesus in his last days, reflecting with the disciples in what is known as Jesus' final discourse with them. This wasn't the time for sentimentality. Jesus' words about leaving the disciples no doubt made them rather <coughs> anxious. He pointed them to the future. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. It's obvious that Jesus felt the disciples were not capable of taking in much more from him at this point in time. One can imagine just how upset and confused they were at the thought of not having Jesus with them. In addition, they had yet to face the turmoil of the crucifixion and the incredible events of the resurrection. Only through the passage of time and new experiences would the disciples grow in their understanding of God. Jesus said to them, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. Jesus wanted the disciples to know that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct them in their ministry and would bring them new insights into the faith. The disciples hadn't discovered all there was to experience and learn, even though they had spent three years in the presence of Jesus. Christ's resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit were to transform their lives and rekindle their ministry. The words of the hymn, Amazing Grace, speak of our ongoing spiritual journey. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We're always growing our relationship with God. There is no point in which we can say we possess all the knowledge, all the faith we need. God is always calling us forth to new insights, 
to a closer relationship with Him. To know God in all of God's complexity and persona is to know God who loves us so much that in the person of His Son, Jesus, God was willing to suffer and die for us. In his letter to the church in Rome, St. Paul speaks about how God is present and active in the world through the life and ministry of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul teaches the community that through the resurrection of Jesus, God has brought reconciliation and peace and upholds them in their suffering. Paul's words remind us that our hope resides in Christ's faithfulness to us and that our hope never lets us down. In the words of Emily Dixon, the great 19th century American poet, sometimes hope really is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. We gladly celebrate those times when hope is easily accessible and affirms our faith. But perhaps real celebration occurs in those character-building struggles in which we find only a remnant of hope, one lone feather in what's left of our soul. Those are the moments that define us and our faith in God. We won't find this truth by reason or intellect. We will find it by the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives and by the gift of the Holy Spirit guiding and nurturing the, tr the church. The good news of this Trinity Sunday is that in spite of the human condition, the turmoil and ambiguity in which we live, God will give us the grace and strength for our ongoing journey of faith filled with love, joy, and peace. Amen. Oh.